All right, welcome back, everybody. Today we're going to be moving into Chapter 7, where we're going to get a whole bunch of integration techniques. So the first one we're going to get today is uh, integration by parts. So we're going to start with Section 7.1. I'll pull up the slides, and let's get moving. Here we go. So this section is about integration by parts, uh, otherwise abbreviated as IBP. So if I say IBP or if I write IBP, what I mean is integration by parts. All right. Um, but before we begin with the technique, we're going to revisit the Riemann integral, the definite Riemann integral, and just look at the mechanics of it again. It's good to review it, um, especially if you don't remember it from Calc 1. We didn't really talk about much integration in, or at least not the mechanics of it, in, in Chapter 6 at all. So we're kind of relying on what you got from Calc 1. So I like to do a bit of review about the mechanics of this, this thing. Um, then we're going to talk about, we're going to take a little tangent and talk about stuff that's on the mathematical horizon, because many of you might be wondering, when am I going to use these things? What purpose is this? What can I do with these types of techniques, these tools? And I, I want to give you some examples of that. Uh, then we're going to derive the formula, do a whole bunch of examples, or at least a few examples. Then we're going to talk about an important technique that comes up a lot when you use integration by parts which is sometimes when you have to solve for the original integral. And then we'll finish up with just some last bits, some last bits, la last bits <laughs> that I wanted to add at the end. All right, so first, revisiting the Riemann integral. Let's uh, throw our minds back into Calc 1 for a minute and recall what this thing is. So you've got to start with a function that's defined on some interval a to b, and we're going to pick a partition of the interval a to b a partition is basically just a, a collection of points where you're going to uh, cut the interval at those points. So there could be n many points, n can be any finite number. Uh, the first point is the left endpoint, and the last point is the right endpoint, and you've got all these points in between, right? So that was like how you set up the definition of the Riemann integral. Then what we define as the definite Riemann integral of f from a to b is the number that is given by this limit if that limit exists, all right? And delta x sub i is just the change in x's depending on the partition. And we say that this integral exists if this limit exists. And if that limit exists, then we say that the function f is Riemann integrable. All right, so a couple little points here I want to make uh, for one this bit, this bit right here, the underline part. When you see this symbol, when you see a definite integral, you need to understand that it is a number. So even though this symbol looks quite complicated, it is a number. It is, intuitively speaking, the area under the curve of f of x from the points a to b, the net area, because if it drops below the x-axis, then the integral will count that as a negative, a negative area. How do we compute that area, or how do we compute that number? It's defined as a limit. It's defined as a limit where the limit is taken as the maximum of the delta x's goes to zero. So basically, the, uh, the space between the points and the partition goes to zero. If your partition is uniform, then that's the same thing as saying the limit as n goes to infinity. The limit as n goes to infinity. But your partition does not need to be uniform. And so this is something that I hope that your Calc 1 teacher talks about. But the partition of the interval a to b does not need to be uniform. It just makes things nice when it is. So <laughs> if you make it uniform, it cleans up the formula a little bit. Here's the basic picture of it. So again, I hope your Calc 1 professor showed you this picture and made you ponder it for a little bit. Um, I'm going to have you ponder it right now. So just kind of stare at it, think about it for a minute, and then we'll talk some more about it. Okay, so the idea is this. If you wanted to know the exact area under this curve, you can get a good approximation by using rectangles. And that's the critical idea. Uh, if I cut up the interval from A to B into a bunch of subintervals using my partition, in this case, it's actually a uniform partition, then what I can do is I can construct or draw some rectangles and the area of this, I'm sorry, the area of all these rectangles will approximate the area under the curve. But it's just an approximation, right? 
So in this case, it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine rectangles. And so if we found the area of all those rectangles and added those areas up, then we would get eh, an approximation of what the exact area under that curve is. That's the idea. Now, as you shrink the intervals, I'm sorry, shrink the subintervals, you get more rectangles and you get a more accurate approximation. So the more rectangles you have, the more accurate the approximation becomes. This piece of the, of the formula here is talking about adding up the areas of those rectangles. So f of x sub i star is, is the height of the rectangle, and delta x sub i is the width of the rectangle. So this product that you see here, that's the area of the rectangles. And this symbol here is saying add up the areas of those rectangles. And then this piece here is saying, take the limit as, as n goes to infinity. Take the limit as the, the subintervals shrink to zero when you're adding up all of those areas. And then if that limit exists, so if this value converges to something as n goes to infinity, infinity then we say that this number is the integral of f from a to b. That's what it is. So one of the big things that you talk about in Calc 1 and one of the things we are going to talk about extensively in this class is the notion of, of approximating things. You get an approximation, you refine the approximation, and if you can essentially infinitely refine it, then you can get the exact value and you can define an exact value as that, that infinitely, infinitely refined approximation. It's kind of the idea. So just a bit of a throwback. Uh, we'll review this again. I come back to the mechanics of the Riemann integral at least a couple of times in this class, but it's good to start remembering it now. Okay, so on the mathematical horizon, I want to say this. Of all of the integration techniques that we learn in this class and that we learn in this chapter, integration by parts is the most important. Uh, I did not like it very much when I learned it in Calc 2, but in retrospect, after going through all of my education and using it in industry and things, Integration by parts is just ubiquitous. It is everywhere. You use it a ton. So I strongly recommend that you get very, very comfortable with integration by parts. Um, you will certainly see it again uh, when you take differential equations, and it's just a very, very powerful technique. What's also interesting is that it turns out that every other technique that we learn in this class, the other integration techniques like uh, trigonometric substitution and things like that, you can actually just recast those as an integration by parts problem. So integration by parts kind of subsumes all of the other techniques that we're gonna learn, but converting everything to an IBP problem might actually make the problem more complicated. So it's worth it to learn other integration techniques like we're gonna learn in this class. Um, but <clears throat> IBP is used all the time, especially when you're solving diff EQs. So I strongly encourage you to get as comfortable with it as you can. We're going to use it a lot. All right. So when can you use it? It turns out that there are some interesting uses of integration by parts when you get into differential equations, and in particular, when you get into a higher dimensional differential equations, um, when problems become really, really interesting. Uh, so for example, Dirichlet problems. Uh, Dirichlet problems are problems where you're trying to find an unknown function that solves a partial differential equation, otherwise called a PDE. And you want to be able to solve this equation in the interior of a given region. And you want, that the, fun you want the function to take on prescribed values on the boundary of the region. So for example, if I had like a circle, what I want to do is I want to find a function that obeys some certain um, rate, rate of change relationships inside the circle. But then on the actual outside of the circle, on the boundary of the circle, I want the, the unknown function to have a certain value. Like I want it to have a certain number. I want the output to be a certain number. And that's called a Dirichlet, a Dirichlet problem. A classic example is that of a vibrating string. So think like vibrating strings, you know, guitar strings, any kind of string that makes a sound, harp strings, that kind of stuff, right? And in that, in that situation, you've basically got a clamped string that is clamped on the ends and it's pulled very tightly. And when you pluck the string, the string will vibrate, right? So there's a couple things going on. If we know how it's vibrating, we may want to re recover an actual formula for the displacement. 
maybe you won't be surprised to think that it's going to be related to sines and cosines and trig functions. It is. Um, that's something that you study at length in a differential equations course. But you'll notice here that at the endpoints, the string is fixed. So in essence, the, the function value, the value of the unknown function that you're searching for is zero at the endpoints. And that becomes very, very nice. So if you're interested in studying the change of, of situations like this or problems like this, you'll use integration by parts a lot because it makes things really, really nice. Um, a very interesting, although maybe more advanced idea related to this is um, related to this article called, Can One Hear the Shape of the Drum? And the problem is essentially this. If you're given what's called the eigenvalue spectrum for the Laplacian with Dirichlet boundary conditions, kind of like this clamped, clamped situation. So if you know this information, which is a bunch of gobbledygook, it's okay. We're not, you don't need to know this for this class. The question is, if you know something about how the region is changing on the interior, can you determine the shape of the actual region itself? So think about, think about a drum, and that's why it's called, can, can you hear the shape of a drum? Basically, if you, were, if, if you had your eyes closed and there was a drum in front of you that had some shape, it may not necessarily be a circle, it may be like a star shape, you know, it may be like, maybe it looks like this, but it, let's just say it's a drum, like a musical drum. If you had your eyes closed and you tapped it and you flicked the drum and you could hear the tones that it makes, just from that information, would you be able to recover the actual shape of the region? That's the question. Can you hear the shape of a drum? That's the question. So I'll let you ponder that if you want to just ponder it for a minute. We can talk a bit more about it um, in activity or in my office hours or something if you'd like. Uh, my advisor actually had done a bit of work on this. He actually uh, got some information related to this problem if the shape was a fractal boundary or if the shape had a fractal boundary, a fractal boundary. So then it becomes even more interesting. But we can talk about that later. So on the mathematical horizon, there's a lot of interesting things that you can do with this. And it turns out that integration by parts pops up a lot in the calculations. <laughs> it pops up all the time in these calculations. So I'm excited for those of you who are, who are going to get to use it in those situations. It's pretty cool. All right. So let's derive the actual integration by parts formula. And here's how we do it. We're going to recall the product rule for derivatives. And that's this thing right here. So remember, if you've got two differentiable functions, f and g, and you want to take the derivative of their product, it ends up being f prime times g plus f times g prime. So hopefully that's familiar. Uh, next, what we're going to do is we're going to integrate both sides of this equation with respect to x, and then we get this follow the following result. This is integrating the, the left side. This is integrating the right side. When we integrate a derivative, we recover the original function. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Then over here, we can split the integral up using linearity of the, of the integral operator, and we get two separate integrals. And now what we can do is we're going to move one of these integrals to the other side. So I'm going to take this one and move it to the other side of the equation. And so then I'm left with this formula right here. And as weird as it looks, that is actually the integration by parts formula. So this is, this is the theorem. This is the formula that we're going to be using. So given two differentiable functions, f and g, differentiable functions, f and g, uh, the integral here of f prime times g is equal to f times g minus this integral right here, this integral right here. And I'll elaborate more on why this looks that way and, and so on as we go along, but let me just say this to begin. The goal of these techniques that we learn in this class is to make evaluating an integral easier. That's really what it is. And so when you look at a formula like this, what I want you to recognize is that we're converting this integral into this instead. And the purpose of that is sometimes it's easier to evaluate this than it is to evaluate this. Because what's happening here is we're taking an integral where we've got a derivative on one of those functions, and we're rewriting it as just evaluating the product of those functions and subtracting the integral of this result. But in this case, notice the, the derivative is on the other function now. 
right? So it was over here, now it's over here. And what we did was we basically just used this to kind of, uh, to kind of influence, or not influence things, but to account for that, that shifting of the derivative, that movement of the derivative. Okay. Um, so this is the formula. Yes, you do need to memorize this formula. You absolutely should memorize it, but sometimes it's easier to remember it when we do a clever substitution or a handy substitution, I should say. So here's what we're going to do. Let's call f of x u and let's call g of x v. Then if we differentiate those things, which we're allowed to do because these functions are differentiable by assumption, we get that du is equal to f prime x dx and dv is equal to g prime x dx. And what we can do is we can just substitute u, v, f prime x dx, and g prime x dx with du, dv, and u and v, and rewrite the formula like this. So this is the same integration by parts formula, but usually it is easier to remember. So it's the integral of u times dv is equal to uv minus the integral of v du, v du. There we go. And I'll give you a handy mnemonic for remembering it in just a minute. But there's one other bit I wanted to say. Let me think. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to skip to this right now. Let me skip to this part right here. Um, this is the formula. And oh, wait, no, sorry. Too far. Wait, wait, wait. Where is it? Where is it? Is it here? It's here. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I'll skip to this. Okay, I'll skip to this and then I'm gonna go back a slide just to, to talk about what I had on the previous slides. So this is the formula that I recommend you, you memorize, u dv equals uv minus integral v du. And one thing I wanna emphasize again is that this is a tool to make integration easier or possible. So that's the goal here. And when you use this technique, you should end up with something that is easier or more possible <laughs> to integrate. So bear that in mind that this is just a tool how you use it is really up to you, and it takes a lot of practice. Um, it also can be applied repeatedly, and we're going to see that today. You may get a new integral that is not quite valuable using elementary techniques, but you might be able to still use integration by parts. And if you use integration by parts again, you might actually end up getting an easier result. So integration by parts can be applied repeatedly as many times as you want. All right? Another thing, when you use this technique, this is the original integral you start with. And when you have this, you are choosing what u and dv are. So this is your choice as a person, and this is a, a skill that you get better at over time. You get better at over time. So when you see an integral like this and you have to use integration by parts, you are going to have to make a choice of what is u and what is dv. So I wanna make that clear. Once you have made those choices, from those choices, you calculate V and DU because you can differentiate U and you can anti-differentiate DV, and then that will give you V. All right, so you choose U and DV and you calculate V and DU. All right, now with that being said, how do you remember this formula? A handy, a handy way to memorize this formula is with the mnemonic UV voodoo. So uv voodoo, <laughs> there you go. So the integral u dv is uv voodoo. That's how you memorize the, the formula. Um, these I kind of touched on already, uh, but I'll emphasize this one here. So remember, you want to get an integral that's easier to evaluate, right? So when you go through this process and you get another integral, you don't want to end up with an integral that is more complicated, like maybe has more powers or higher powers or just looks more difficult. <laughs> so uh, if you use this technique, if you use integration by parts and the resulting integral is more complicated than the one you started with, then you made the wrong choice. You made the wrong choice for u and dv. You need to stop, back up, go back to the beginning and pick different choices for u and dv. All right, so a telltale sign. If you end up with something more complicated, you made the wrong choice for u and dv go back, try again, and hopefully it works better the next time. <laughs> All right, so let me flash back real quick to the slides that I skipped. Um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but naturally the integration by parts formula also holds for definite integrals. So this is a technique that works for definite and indefinite integrals. 
So it can give you numbers and it can give you antiderivatives. Um, here is the formula for definite integrals. And it's really not too bad. The only catch is that when you use integration by parts to rewrite your new integral like this, you have to evaluate the product f, f, and g at the endpoints a and b. And then you'll still have this integral that you have to evaluate as well. So you'll have to, you'll have to do that as you go along. You've got to remember that if you've got a definite integral and you get that product out there, you will have to evaluate it at the endpoints. All right, keep that in mind. We'll, we'll do an example of it in just a minute too, here as well. Now, here's another cool thing. So going back to what's on the mathematical horizon and that notion of Dirichlet problems and like the, uh, the clamped string idea, right? The vibrating string, check this out. If your function is zero on the boundary of the interval, so for example, like that clamped string, right? It's zero right here. Put this like on the, on the X axis, right? X, Y. So if your function value is zero on those endpoints, well, that means that f of a and f of b are equal to zero. So when you use the integration by parts formula, what you get is this. Remember, you have to evaluate this product at those endpoints. But if f is zero and g is zero, then, or sorry, if f is zero, my apologies, if f is zero at those endpoints, then this product is zero. And so what you end up getting is this. You end up getting that the integration by parts formula is just your original integral is equal to the opposite of that integral, but the derivative has changed functions. <laughs> so as, as my, <laughs> as my uh, graduate differential equations professors used to say, you're just moving the derivative from one function to another using integration by parts. But it only works that way if your function is zero on the boundary. So this is why this becomes so powerful, because you can basically move a derivative from one piece to another inside the integral, which is pretty cool. If your function is not zero on the boundary, then you'll always have this additional term that, that you carry with you. So pretty cool stuff. Cool stuff. OK. All right. Let's do an example now. So let's do an example here. Um, I'm going to go through this one, and then I will let you try the next one on your own, and then we'll talk about it. So. Here's one, let's find the integral of x times sine of x dx. Now outright elementary techniques will not work for this because this product doesn't lend itself to elementary anti-differentiation. You can't just use u substitution and it doesn't just have an elementary antiderivative that we haven't computed yet, right? So this is a good time to use integration by parts. Now, when we're gonna use integration by parts, we have to make a choice we've got to choose what are we going to call u and what are we going to call dv, right? u dv equals uv voodoo. So what are we going to call u? What are we going to call dv? We make the choice. I'm going to let u be x and dv be the rest of it. So notice how I made this choice. Let me highlight it here. I called that u and I called this dv, all right? So when you make these choices, it should exhaust the entire integrand. Your choices should completely cover the integrand, including the differential over here. So I let u be x and dv be the rest, sine x dx. Now, because of that choice, that means the derivative of u is just 1. <laughs> so du is dx, and v is negative cosine x, because I anti-differentiated sine. All right. I chose u and dv, and then I calculated du and v. Now I use the integration by parts formula. x sine x dx should follow this form. u is x, v is negative cosine x minus, v is negative cosine x, and du is dx. There it is. So you're just literally substituting all of those pieces, u, dv, du, v. Substitute all those pieces and you get a new result. This is the new result right down here. And now check this out. Lo and behold, this integral is just the integral of cosine x. That's just the antiderivative of cosine, which is going to be sine because derivative of sine is cosine. So we anti-differentiate, we get sine, and then now here's where the plus c comes in. Remember, you've got to include a plus c when you have an indefinite integral. Got to include a plus c. 
And that's because indefinite integrals are not numbers. Indefinite integrals represent a family of antiderivatives. So this thing is representing a family of functions. In this case, it's representing this family of functions, the functions that are negative x cosine x plus sine x, and then any vertical shift of those functions. All right? So that's how we do it. Again, just to review, u choose u and dv, then you calculate du and v. Now you try. So here we go. Here's another one. Uh, this one is t squared times e to the t dt. And what I want you to do is first think about what you should choose or what you feel you should choose for u and dv. Think about it. All right, now you got to say something out loud. Say your choices out loud, and then you're going to write them down. What is u and what is dv? All right, say them, and then write them down. Just start by writing that sentence. Let u be and let dv be, all right, or equals, right? So write that sentence, and then try to use integration by parts. We'll do it together in a moment. All right, here we go. So uh, one thing I notice is that when I differentiate t squared, it becomes simpler. So that's a good that's a good tell. If something is going to get simpler when I differentiate it, that maybe that's a good choice of u because I'm going to have to differentiate u. Whereas e to the t remains unchanged. So I'm going to let u be t squared and dv be e to the t dt. Then when I differentiate here, I get du is 2t dt and v is e to the t. So the integration by parts formula, which is uv voodoo, right? Becomes this, uv minus the integral of v du. Sweet, so hopefully you got something similar. Um, if you chose the opposite, so for example, if you chose the opposite and you instead let, uh, let me do this, if you said let u be e to the t and dv be a t squared dt, then what you should have found when you did the next step is that v was more complicated. So watch this. Let me move this out of the way here. Watch this. Uh, here, this implies that v is going to be what? One third t cubed? Yeah, that's right, because when I differentiate that, I'll get t squared. But look, see, when I do that antiderivative, I get a higher power. So if I have a higher power, that means the integral that I would get here is actually going to be more complicated because now I'm going to have a t cubed in there. I'm, I'm still going to have an e to the t, but I'm also going to have a t cubed. So it's kind of like going the opposite direction that we want. So these are not good choices. These are not good choices. And that skill, that technique is something that you develop with practice, something that you develop with practice. Okay. Now, now, oh wait, I wanted to leave that. So now where are we at? So we didn't make those choices. Now where we're at is this right here. Okay, so now look at this integral by comparison. Here's the integral we started with. Here's the integral we have now. That integral is simpler than the one that we started with. You notice here the power for t is actually one instead of two. We've made progress. That means it was a good choice. It was a good choice because now we our job is easier. <laughs> we have a simpler integral to work with, a simpler integral to try to find good choice. However, we're still at a point where we can't just use a basic integration technique like substitution or just a, a simple antiderivative. We're going to have to use integration by parts again, integration by parts again. So now I want you to try this next step. Focus all your attention on this integral and try to integrate that one by parts. So go ahead and think about that one for a minute and then work it out yourself. You choose u and dv. All right, now let's do it together. Um, maybe now with the, the conversation we just had a moment ago, you would think to choose u to be t and dv to be e to the t. That would be a good choice. That would be a good choice. Um, I'll make a comment about the choice here in just a moment, but let's go through with the calculation. If u is t, then du is dt. And if dv is e to the t dt, then v is e to the t again. Thus, our original integral 
which we massaged into this expression, we're now going to use integration by parts on just this integral, and we get this. So a quick note about this computation, parentheses are your friends. I always tell my students this, parentheses are your friends. They help keep everything grouped and associated the way you want, just like your friends do, right? Keeping everything everything together in, 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 in the little click, right? <laughs> so we integrated by parts this integral. So this integral becomes this entire expression. We must have parentheses. If you do not have parentheses, the result will not be correct. So if you forget these, you've made a mistake. Right? And so you, what you want to do is you really do want to start writing your calculations in a clean, ordered way, respecting the equal sign along the way. I'll talk more about this later on in the lecture, but let's continue here. Um, t e to the t is just t e to the t. But now look, the integral that we have is elementary. It's just the integral of e to the t dt, which is just e to the t. There we go. Now that we no longer have an integral involved, we have to include a plus c because we've left integral land and now we are into just antiderivative land. And so we have a family of antiderivatives. Then we can simplify. We can simplify. And uh, what I did here was I actually relabeled negative two times C as C1 because negative two times C is just a constant and the constant is, uh, is arbitrary if we don't have any initial conditions. Okay. All right. So quick note, I want to backtrack to this thing over here. And I want to point out a subtlety that is important. Notice that when I did my second integration by parts, I picked different letters. <laughs> I picked different letters. Instead of using U and DV, I did capital U and capital or D capital V. You do need to use different letters for different integration by parts steps. All right. So you've got to be precise. So in the beginning, if you want to use under uh, undercase, <laughs> lowercase U, and lowercase v, you can, but if you need to do another integration by parts, then you need to use a different letter than the first one that you used before, all right? And if you have to do integration by parts a third time, you need to use a different letter again. And if you need to do integration by parts a fourth time, you need to use a different letter again, and so on and so on. So don't reuse the letters, don't reuse the letters. All right, next, let's try this one. All right, we've got a definite integral this time, <clears throat> and I want you to practice this one on your own, and then we'll do it together. So start by thinking about what you would choose u and dv to be, and then say out loud what you would choose. All right, now try to work it out on your own, and then we'll do it together in just a minute. Just remember you have a definite integral. All right, let's do it together. Uh, in this case, there really is not much of a choice. <laughs> there isn't much of a choice. Um, yeah, you, uh, <laughs> you basically have to choose u to be arctangent and dv to be dx. So that's what we're going to do. Um, let's let u be arctangent or tangent inverse, and let's let dv be dx. Uh, then the derivative of u is one over one plus x squared. Remember, that's one that you need to have memorized. And if I anti-differentiate dv dx, I get x. So v is x. Now we just use uv voodoo. So our original integral is u times v, evaluated at 0 and 1, minus the integral of v times du. Right? So du is this. Sorry, I highlighted the wrong part. du is this, and v is x. So this piece right here is v du. Remember, the, um, the formula is uv minus v du. There we go. All right, now we proceed. So let me grab my laser pointer here. So we're going to evaluate this product. There's no antiderivative here. There's no derivative here. It's just a product, so we can evaluate it. Um, plug in 1 for x. And you get this. Plug in 0 for x, and you get 0. So now we've finished this piece on the outside. It's just pi over 4. And now we're left with this integral right here. And the goal here, remember, the goal is to end up with a simpler integral. And it actually looks like we have one. This one is just kind of like a single, a single termed integrand. And there's not much we can do except integration by parts. Now we have this. 
And if you look at it for a minute, you'll actually see that this one you can tackle using a U substitution. So that's what we're going to do now. Uh, we're going to pull another tool out of the box, the substitution rule. I'm going to say let t be 1 plus x squared, then dt equals 2x dx. When, and remember, <laughs> again, I hope your teacher harped on you about this as well. When you change your variable of integration, you must change the bounds of integration. Yes, you must every time. We can talk more about that in activity. You can ask me about it in office hours. Yes, you must change it. So when x is 0, t becomes 1. And when x is 1, t becomes 2. So our new integral is this one. This integral right here becomes this. Those two integrals are equal. And that's why I'm allowed to continue to write equal. All right. Now, here's the beautiful part. This, we can actually evaluate. This one we know. What is that integral? <laughs> what is the integral of 1 over t? Well, the antiderivative of it is going to be natural log, right? So we get natural log of t evaluated at 2 and 1. Take the difference. Uh, we do not need a plus c over here because this is a definite integral. So there's no family of functions here. It's just a number. This thing here is just a number. Turns out it's this number. <laughs> That's the number that it's equal to. So the area under this curve from 0 to 1 is pi over 4 minus 1 half log 2. There we go. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. All right. Um, oh, good, good. I was just about to say this as well. So leading into the next slide, we're going to talk about solving for the original integral in a moment. But one thing I really, really do need to emphasize is you need to start writing your integral calculations as a chain of true equalities. So you really must do this. Hold yourself to it, practice it, respect the equal sign, and hold yourself to that respect, respecting the equal sign. Okay? You really, really have to, and you're going to see why when we get to this next example right here, because sometimes you're going to have to solve for the original integral. So it turns out some integrals you can't even evaluate using any of the elementary techniques that we learned in this course. They, they just won't give in to those techniques. But sometimes what you can do is arrive at an equation where you can solve for the original integral, where you'll be able to solve for it, meaning the original integral will appear in multiple places in the equation, and you can combine like terms and solve for it. We're going to see that right now. Um, this happens a lot. So this happens quite often. So like I just mentioned a minute ago, you need to write your calculations as chains of true equalities, uh, just like is shown in every slide and every activity solution in this course. So one of the things I mentioned in the syllabus and one of the things I'll reiterate now, you should be emulating the solutions that you see in these slides and in the activity solutions. I just want to be clear about that. You want to try to get to the point where you can write your calculations exactly the way that I am writing them. This right here is your goal. So by the end of the course, you should be able to write your calculations like that. That's what you want to work toward, all right? Um, I can help you in activity. Just ask me about it. I can show you more examples. But a good place to start is every calculation you see on the slides, every calculation you see in the activity solutions. Try to emulate that. OK, here we go. We're going to get right into it now. So let's evaluate this integral. Uh, we're going to have to use integration by parts. So we're going to do it. Um, let's let u be sine of x and dv be e to the x dx. Then du is cosine x dx and v is e to the x. So the integration by parts formula gives us this, uv voodoo. Uh, like I mentioned here, this integral is actually not any simpler, but it's also not any more difficult. So that means that we made a good choice. We haven't made our life harder. <laughs> haven't made our life harder. So we should just continue. Uh, the integral is similar to what we started with. So we're probably going to use integration by parts again. Let's try it. Let's pick a new value for u or a new, a new function for u and pick a new differential for dv. All right. So we do that. Let u be cosine x, dv be e to the x dx. Then du is negative sine, and v is e to the x. Now we can go back and convert this integral into this expression in parentheses, right? u v minus v du, u v voodoo. 
And again, parentheses are your friends. Parentheses are your friends. You must include them. <laughs> Do not forget them. Don't forget your friends. Um, now we can simplify a little bit. When we simplify a little bit, we get this. And then here's the important part. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the next slide so we can see it laid out. This is the same calculation that was on the previous slide, but I wanted to emphasize something. This is the integral we started with. And it appeared in our calculations again, it appeared in a second location. When we computed this or simplified this integral, we got the original integral again. Now, remember, this is just an expression, and this is the same expression on the other side of an equal sign. This is just a chain of equalities. So I've got this equals this minus itself. So we are allowed to combine like terms. We can take this term and add it to this term, which is on the other side. And in doing so, we will have solved for the original integral. Here we go. I'm just literally going to add this to both sides. So now on this side, I will have two of those integrals. And then on the right, the right hand side, I'll just have what's left, this piece. You see that? Now I just divide everything by two and I've, I've done, I'm done, I've solved for the integral. The integral e to the x sine x dx is equal to one half e to the x sine x minus one half e to the x cosine x, and then a plus c. Got to include a plus c at the very end. Okay, so one of the reasons why I'm saying that you must write your calculations as chains of true equalities is because if you're not, if you're just writing this calculation as scratch work and just kind of like doing some stuff off to the side, you're going to reach a point where you don't recognize that you can combine like terms because you will not have a chain of true equalities that reveals the structure you're working with. So yes, you must try to write these as chains of true equalities to organize your thoughts and organize your results so that you'll be able to see where to go next. All right? Okay, so I hope I've made my point with that. Um, but you often have to do this. So be prepared to have to do integration by parts multiple times and have to solve for the original integral. That's a very common technique. All right, almost done now. Let's go to the last bits. So um, last bits, um, integration by parts is a skill that takes a lot of practice to develop. It's, this is actually one of the reasons why students struggle a lot with Calc 2, and I struggled with it immensely when I took it as an undergrad. Um, the integration techniques that we learn are very organic, and it takes a lot of practice and trial and error and success and failure to get good at integration. And that's really the only thing you can do. Do the homework, practice all of these things, keep up with the class, watch these lectures, ask me questions. It just takes a lot of practice, but that is why you are here in Calc 2 right now. That is the purpose of this part of the course, for you to take this time and practice these techniques and master these techniques now. That way you won't have to keep mastering them later on. So it takes a lot of practice. The other thing, if your first choices of U and DV don't work, go back and try different choices. That's really what it is. You'll find that once you practice a bit, you'll get quite quick with this technique and you'll be like, oh, okay, like that was just the wrong choice. Pick something else, try again. It should only take, you know, less than a minute to figure that out. Uh, a, a little bit of a side note here. If you have heard of it, liate or detail is sometimes what it's referred to as. Uh, is a is a mnemonic to help you figure out what you should choose for u and dv. Um, it is often right, but it is not always right. And so I don't recommend relying on it. Um, you'll hear people say this. I know some other professors like to teach this in their course, but I don't recommend it. I don't recommend Lie 8. It's not right all the time, and it's very easy to come up with examples where it fails. Here are two examples of failure right here. So if you follow the suggestion of Lie 8, you can look it up on your own. Um, it will fail on something like this, and it will fail on something like this. So I don't bother spending a lot of time with it. Um, the other bit, so for those of you that have heard of this before, and I know other professors also like to teach this method, um, you are not allowed to use the tabular method in this course. So what is the tabular method? You can look it up on your own if you would like, but the tabular method is basically a shorthand algorithm to help you compute integration by parts multiple times. 
So maybe if you have to integrate by parts several times in a row, the tabular method gives you an algorithm for doing that to get to the final answer. Um, you are not allowed to use that method in this course. The reason for it is, frankly, we already have computers that can do integration by parts. And they can do integration by parts faster than you will ever be able to do integration by parts. What's more important to me is that you understand how integration by parts is working and that you can carefully and concisely lay out the exact process of integration by parts. Again, the, the exercises that we see in this class, we already know the answers. <laughs> we already know the answers. Your doing these exercises is to help you get practice with these ideas. So don't take shortcuts, just go through the, the, the standard process, make sure you understand every step and you could explain every step, that's your goal. So no tabular method in the course, sorry. I don't recommend Lie8, sorry. But if you wanna learn it on your own, you are more than welcome to. You're just not allowed to use tabular method in this course. All right, so on that note, let's play, <laughs> let's play. Um, we'll do, act we'll do these, these problems like this on the activity uh, when we meet. I think that's about it. I said my last bits. So rather than ramble on, I will say goodbye and I'll see you next time. Thank you again for watching.